Hello book lovers and welcome to Book Talk Radio Club. My name is Claire Perkins and today I'm talking to author Janine Kitchell. Janine is the author of Wheels Up, a novel of drugs, cartels and survival. Hi Janine, welcome and thank you for coming on Book Talk Radio Club. Hi Claire and, and thank you for having me. My pleasure. Would you like to give Book Talk Radio Club's listeners a brief synopsis of Wheels Up? Sure. So Wheels Up, a novel of drugs, cartels, and survival, is the story of Leila Navarro, who soars to the top of Mexico's top cartel when her powerful drug lord uncle is imprisoned. And uh, as a newcomer, she needs to learn the rules and the ropes in a Mexican machismo world. So she decides to prove herself by taking a a deal uh, from a Canadian pot dealer to move cocaine, two tons of Colombian cocaine from Colombia to Cancun by jet. And at a stopover in Guatemala, uh, she meets the capo, the head man in their Guatemala operations and discovers that he has a, a, a very dirty secret that is is overpowering. So they depart the Guatemala City airport at dawn and they have very little jet fuel. So as they approach Cancun, the, they're denied landing rights. The plane crashes in the Yucatan jungle, and from there, uh, she must survive so that she can bring revenge to this man who has caused the situation to occur. Oh, sounds so interesting. It's a good book. So Leila Navarro is a heroine, as you said, of your book, and a new head of a dominant Mexican cartel. And she must be quite a tough cookie to run a drugs cartel, but does she have a softer side? Well, I try to... She's a flawed protagonist. Uh, uh, once again, she's a, a woman in a very male-dominated world, so she's basically a persona non grata. Mm-hmm. And I, I try to portray her more or less like um, Walter White, from Breaking Bad fame, or even Michael Corleone from the early Godfather, from the book and then from the first movie, where she's just an ordinary person who's thrown into an an impossible situation, and also kind of in a a very simple-minded person, unaware of the dealings of what's actually going on. So uh, once again, she she has not been part of the the workings, the daily workings of the cartel. She sat behind a desk for 10 years as a cartel accountant, so she really didn't know the seedy side of what was happening. Um, and she's in way over her head, so that makes her vulnerable, and it, it gives her a softer side just by the fact that she's not in the in the know. Right. Uh, so she's had, like, some very early experiences that were uh, pretty powerful, and that affected her. And it made her more, um, I, uh, from what readers tell me, it's made her a more vulnerable and a more likable heroine. So Leila accepts an offer to move two tons of cocaine from Colombia to Cancun by jet. Along for the ride are her abusive bodyguard lover, the laid-back Canadian pot brewer who set up the deal, and a coke-addicted Vietnam vet. A bit of a motley crew there. So tell me about Leila's bodyguard lover. Is he abusive towards her or people that he sees as a threat to her or their relationship? Basically, he is a very, he's a handsome hulk of a man, and their relationship works out best in the bedroom uh-huh. rather than the boardroom. And, but the unfortunate thing is, is that he must totally protect her, and so he is wary of anyone that's, that's nearby or, or talking to her, and he's also a very obsessive and controlling man. So, uh, but Basically, the two of them are really imprisoned in this relationship because uh, you don't quit the cartel, the cartel quits you. So he cannot really leave this situation. So it makes him surly. Uh, He's also known by his organization, by the others in the cartel, that he's a little bit of a a hot-headed individual. But it also makes him very good at his job. So he is, he's only uh, kind to her on rare occasions, but those occasions do exist. So, yeah, he, he is a very, he's, he's a, a very complicated man. So Will Sup is rich with subplots, captivating characters and local colour. The novel is set in the Yucatan Peninsula in southeastern Mexico. Tell me about some of the local colour of this region. Oh, God. Mexico's Yucatan is, is just simply so gorgeous. Uh, my husband and I fell in love with the Mexican Caribbean coast 
in the early 80s. And it's like these wide white sand beaches and to the southern part of the state, there's like a lowland dense forests. And then there's also jungle like everywhere. And uh, it, it, it's just so simply amazing. When we were early on there, uh, we were going to uh, Pyramids at Koba, which is about 40 miles west of Tulum. And most people have heard of Tulum. It's yeah. a very popular, echo trendy spot right now. Mm -hmm. But at, at that time, we were on a narrow two-lane paved highway, and there was literally no berm. Uh, you, if you, if your car veered a little to the right, it was like a five-foot chasm to the drop below. And while we were traversing this highway, like we saw an eighteen-wheeler literally suspended, an eighteen-wheeler truck suspended on the right-hand side of the road in the jungle. Oh my and God. I, by Velcro, and it was like the, the vines had started to take it back, and it was wow. this type of thing. It was like a local color. I mean, we were just like blown away and amazed because it's like those are the types of things that you see. The jungle is still there, even though there's Cancun's a million mm -hmm. and the hotel zone and all these wonderful little beach cities. The, the jungle is just waiting to take you back. I was just so, going to say, na nature will, 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 will win out. Yeah, exactly. And then, of course, the local color is the pyramids, and the Maya pyramids are just so incredibly fascinating, like astounding, and, and, and it's like you're being transported back in time. So there was a lot to write about, and one of my early editorial reviews, the, the writer, the reviewer wrote that uh, the beauty of Mexico, Mexico is really punctuated in the story, and as a former travel writer, I, I think that I, it does shine through. I always like to ask authors where they came up with the idea for their book. So what inspired you to write Wheels Up? Obviously, obviously where you live has inspired you, but what else? Yes, well, basically, like, living in Mexico for 15 years, it, it gave me a really good understanding of not all, only the, the place, but, like, um, I had, like, an insider's insight into uh, how Mexico worked. Mm. And we, we, uh, we built a house there, and then in 97... We left San Francisco and moved their lock, sock, and barrel. And at the time, I founded a bookstore. And by having a bookstore uh, in a very, it was very remote at the time, the area, I, I met local Maya, the uh, explorers, archaeologists, uh, expats, other travelers. Mm. And so it was con this constant stream of people with these stories, amazing stories that were just like, like you know, coming through my life every day. Yeah. So... I, I was like, I, it was just, especially as a writer, it was like this, like, rich um, soil for mm -hmm. me to like, build things on. But I was a nonfiction writer. And then slowly, um, I started to notice the creeping dominance of the cartels. Mm -hmm. And so I felt um, uh, that it would be great to be able to write a, a fictionalized account of of what I saw happening. And so, so some of the parts of the novel are based on fact, but for the most part, it's a fictionalized novel. You've written for the Miami Herald, El Universal, the Herald Mexico City, and Fodor's Travel Guides. You've also published Where the Sky is Born, which is a travel memoir, which details how a dream became reality when you and your husband left America to pursue the goal of living in Mexico. I mean, it sounds fantastic. It sounds like you're on vacation every day. I, I have to ask, where the, why the title Where the Sky is Born? That, that intrigues me. Right. Well, it's actually, it's a Mayan phrase. In Mayan, it's it's called Sian Khan. Right. And in Sian Khan uh, is uh, actually a place. It's, it's now a biosphere. It's a 6,000 square kilometer biosphere right. just south of Tulum. And it's on a narrow uh, peninsula. And the peninsula is, once again, very, very narrow, like the road. It's a Saskab, dusty road. Mm -hmm. And you it's about... 50 miles down to the end of this little peninsula, and at the end, there's a teeny little town called Punta Allen, but on those 50 miles that you're driving through these potholes and, you know, hoping you're not going to get a flat tire, <laughs> it, you're seeing just sky. I mean, you it's like you and this huge sky, right. and basically, and then turquoise blue water, so the Maya believed that this was where the sky was born. And and if you ever have a chance to get there or any of your listeners, 
it really feels like it's you in the sky. How beautiful. Oh, it sounds it wonderful. Was, it sounds absolutely wonderful. Yes, it, it, it's just so gorgeous. And, of course, uh, it, you know, there are crocodiles, fish, um, reefs. It, it's, it's this wonderful uh, ecological reserve. It's now a UNESCO site as well. And so many people, um, not many people really do it just because it's, it's a tough, it, you know, you got to kind of prepare for it. You got to have plenty of water and, right. you know, sandwiches and, and all that. And then once you get to Punta Alley, like there's like, all there is, is like, there's a Coke machine, you know, it, it's like nothing. <laughs> so then, then you turn around and you come back. So, but it, the feeling makes you feel like you're one with nature. You have a love of the mayor and have become a serious mayor file, which has led you both to pyramid sites throughout southern Mexico. Who are the mayor and why the fascination? Well, as um, we all know, the Maya have never gone away. They're, 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 they're strong and there's like seven to 8,000 Maya for sure in the Yucatan Peninsula alone. Right. Uh, but the ancient Maya, now the ancient Maya, they... Uh, more or less abandoned the pyramids around uh, 900 AD, and then it strung along till about 1200 AD. Uh, but they were uh, mathematicians, stargazers, uh, scientists. They created the first uh, written language. Uh, and of course, they created these incredible pyramids in the jungle. Mm -hmm. And the early, early explorers, like in the 1830s, uh, there was a, a U.S. writer and a, a Brit um, artist, and they stumbled, well, they they knew that there were, like, something there, a civilization. They'd heard rumors through various things, and uh, they stumbled onto these huge mounds in both, like, Chichen Itza, which is a very famous site, mm. and also Palenque, but the, the locals who lived there had no understanding or knowledge of what these mounds were or who the people were. And it's because uh, in, in the, the readings from the archaeologists, they believe that a 300-year drought around the year 900 AD came and, and it created a diaspora of mm -hmm. the Maya. Mm -hmm. They had to it abandon the cities and they became hunter-gatherers, so there was no knowledge of, of who they were. But the mere fact that they created a written, a written uh, language was incredible, and it was placed on these huge stella, which were like six foot by three foot stone slabs in front of all of the pyramids, and, and it was hieroglyphic. And those were finally, uh, the code was finally cracked in 1970. At, it was called the Palenque Roundtable, where 20 archaeologists from throughout the world came and gathered. Mm. And they, the, the Maya, they had also written on paper bark books, and they had created roughly 3,000, but the Spanish priests burned all but three. <laughs> So they were called codices, and three of these were retained and, and saved. And through that, and then the Maya Roundtable, the Palenque Roundtable, they broke the code. And, and it was like an incredible thing that nobody in the 1830s, when these two explorers went down to Central America and Mexico, no Western European or North American mind wanted to give due to what they considered an indigenous civilization. They mm -hmm. felt that it couldn't happen, that they were just, they were not this, this grand society and civilization that they were. I mean, they reigned for, they had 1,500 years of calm, and before that, they, they basically started around 900 B.C., mm -hmm. so they had a long run. Uh, but now we are, of course, giving them their due, and and anyway, I've, I've been fascinated by them, and the most important thing is they are called naked eye astronomers, and what they did was they recorded the night sky mm. day by day, month by month, year by year, century by century for over a thousand years, and so they, without the use of a slide rule or a telescope or binoculars, they came to know the night sky so that they could be picked when um, uh, eclipses would happen and uh, Venus was the star that they are the planet that they followed and that was there like for wars or for, for famine or things to watch out for. But these codices, the ones that were destroyed, unfortunately held a lot of information but we have gleaned from the three remaining ones that they were just this incredible civilization, and so that's why I'm, I'm awestruck by them. I can hear that. And you, yeah. I, have you written a book about them? 
Well, I did a book uh, called Maya 2012 Revealed, Demystifying the Prophecy, and that came out in uh, 2012, uh, mm-hmm. when the year of the calendar phenomenon. Sure. Because no one else had, had written it, and I decided somebody had to, and that was me. <laughs> <laughs> you have some great reviews over on Amazon for Wheels Up, including the reader gets to experience a roller coaster ride and action filled with a cast of characters Fellini would admire. And if you enjoy Baldacci, give this thriller a read. It compares quite favourably to his best. I mean, that's pretty impressive, Janine. Tell me, what was the proudest moment for you, the first sale or the first review, and why? The first review. Oh, <laughs> it's just wonderful. And it just, it just, warms the cockles of a writer's heart to hear that somebody else gets your story absolutely so so that was for me my most exciting moment i i would say out of all of the interview um authors i've interviewed i would say about 90 percent of them all say the same thing the first review it's nice to hear that your husband your wife your partner whatever your parents love to you know love your book but when you have someone who you have no idea who it is loves your book and gives you a great review it makes you feel so good doesn't it Oh, my goodness. It, it, it's just it's the top. <laughs> <laughs> so is Wheels Up a one-off or the first in a series? Now, this is a trilogy, uh, okay. and uh, the next one I'm working on, uh, uh, the second in the trilogy, and it's called Layla's Law. Ah. So where can Book Talk Radio listeners purchase uh, Wheels Up, and also your other books, of course? Yes. Uh, it's available on Amazon in either Kindle or paperback, mm-hmm. and... Uh, basically, that's the easiest and the best way to find them. All right. Well, thank you, Janine. Please come back on Book Talk Radio Club when you publish your next book, and I'd love to chat with you and hear more. In the meantime, good luck for the future, and thank you, everyone, for listening to Book Talk Radio Club. Thank you, Janine. Thank you so much, Claire. I appreciated your time. Oh, my pleasure.